Week Extra. I'm Amy Walter. Let's continue the conversation where we left off and discuss some of the things we didn't get to in the broadcast. Joining me tonight are three reporters covering the issues. Aaron Haynes, editor at large for the 19th, Eamon Javers, senior White House correspondent for CNBC, and Jane Mayer, chief Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. Um, Eamon, since I cut you off during the broadcast, I'm going to start with you and and guns. The, the president came out this week putting executive orders out on uh, gun control. If you can talk about what those will do, and more importantly, what it says about the president and, and the White House and just how unlikely they think, perhaps, I'm seeing this, that, that legislation on guns will make it through Congress. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole ball game, right? I mean, on guns, they've clearly decided that executive action from the White House is where they need to go uh, because nothing's going to happen on Capitol Hill. The opposition to any gun control is so deep uh, in American politics that it's just, not a, it's just a non-starter, right? So you go with some executive action, but the president doesn't seem to want to get his infrastructure bill off of the front pages. That's the main priority for this White House. They have to do some things that they said they were going to do around gun control, so they're doing that. But clearly the priority is, is spending this money and, and becoming a transformational presidency in terms of the enormous amount of political money that's going out there, or, or of, of government money that's going out there into the economy and into the social system. That's going to be a transformative thing, and I think Biden knows that. Uh, and the one thing I wanted to say, Amy, about this debate that we were having earlier uh, on the question of Mitch McConnell and what role companies should should play in all of this, uh, you know, it, it strikes me this really goes to the heart of the question of what is a corporate campaign contribution all about, right? There have been two ways to look at it. The cynical way is, you know, this is sort of a very polite extortion game run by politicians in Washington who say, if you want to play, you got to pay, and so the companies are paying both sides with these campaign contributions. The other way is to say, hey, these are just companies who have political opinions and they're voicing them through this campaign system. That's the polite way to say it. But when you're asking companies to be quiet politically, not to say anything, but to keep the campaign cash going, you, you look like you're leaning more toward the one side than the other. And I think that's why you saw McConnell back off that and say, no, 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 okay, companies can say whatever they want. I, I misspoke a little bit, which you rarely see from McConnell. Right. Corporations are indeed people at the end of the day. Um, Aaron, let's talk about uh, what Amy brought up, this, this infrastructure bill. And Republicans are criticizing it, saying that Democrats are now calling all kinds of things infrastructure that have nothing to do with bricks and mortar and roads, uh, including things like home health care and others. Can you can you talk about how uh, the Biden administration is defining infrastructure and how different that could be from anything else we've seen before? Well, Amy, frankly, they're looking to redefine it, right? Yeah. Much as they have to redefine bipartisanship here in these first hundred days, uh, looking outside of Washington for a definition of bipartisanship and now looking beyond roads and bridges and the things that we kind of traditionally think about in terms of what infrastructure is, right? Uh, President Biden, in, in kind of laying out the case for this $2 trillion package this week, talked about the evolution of infrastructure, how, you know, a, in our grandparents' generation, we couldn't have envisioned highways as being a part of our, our infrastructure, but certainly everybody, uh, you know, alive and around today considers uh, highways part of our infrastructure. But but then maybe even our grandparents' parents uh, and, and their parents before them thinking about bridges in terms of, of being infrastructure, that was not something that they could have envisioned as being, being you know, just kind of a core part of how this country works and what is required uh, for this country to work. And so now looking ahead, in the 21st century, uh, Joe Biden is saying things like broadband, especially in rural communities. You think about how crucial the internet was to, uh, you know, to young people in the pandemic attempting to learn, but also uh, for so many workers who were working from home. I mean, that the, the internet was a lifeline uh, for those people and the difference between whether or not they were frankly able to participate in the workforce. And, and then the caregiving piece, literally having to think about how you find, uh, you know, the, the um, frankly, infrastructure in your household to deal with uh, your child or possibly an elderly loved one. Like, if you cannot navigate that, that's the reason that we saw hundreds of thousands of women in particular dropping out of the workforce and also marginalized folks, uh, the, the women of color who are largely the essential workers 
who made up the caregiving workforce, uh, having to make choices between, uh, you know, being on the front lines and, and being exposed to uh, the coronavirus and earning a living. And so uh, he is uh, now, the president is now attempting to, to really bring uh, those types of things into the conversation around infrastructure, clean water as, as, as an infrastructure, which would seem kind of like a no brainer. But yes, I mean, if you don't have clean water, uh, the infrastructure of your community certainly is not as solid. And, and, and so uh, I think that a lot of Americans, uh, given their uh, the polling and what the polling shows about their support for these uh, issues and, and for the bill as a whole uh, indicates that they may be on board with the president's definition. And Jane, I, I want to go to you just one more dark money uh, issue here, and that's the Supreme Court. On the docket is a case called American F Americans for Prosperity versus Rodriguez. Can you talk a little bit about what that case is about and what it could, what a ruling could mean for these groups? There's certainly a few people who see that as uh, sort of the the, the camel's nose in the tent, moving towards um, trying to um, have more dark money, more uh, secrecy for donors. It's a case that involves uh, the laws in California, which required big donors to um, to uh, nonprofits to disclose who they were just to the state. Um, and and these, uh, it's uh, the dark money groups are saying they shouldn't have to even tell the state officials who their big donors are. And what, what people who oppose sort of secret spending are saying is this could be a precedent for trying to define a constitutional right to be a secret spender, that you have a right to privacy when you spend money, which could get you to a point where there may be no disclosure at all in American politics. So that's what people are, why they're watching this particular case. So it could, Jane, it could mean more than just these groups. It could mean even just traditional campaign filing reports that we're used to seeing where individuals writing checks, that could be threatened too, well, do they think? It has, it certainly is not, not this, it's not there yet, and mm. this case would not um, bring that about, mm. but what it is is it's sort of beginning to lay the groundwork, just as we saw with Citizens United. It took 10 years right. to get to the point where that was passed, and so, um, where the Supreme Court upheld that, and so, it takes years, and the, there are sort of advocacy, advocacy groups that are pushing case after case after case, and each step gets you closer to the ultimate goal, and that's why people are taking a look at this case. It's, it's interesting. It's a, big, it's a beginning of a big test case about secrecy and money in American politics. And we should know by the summer then, Jane, what, what it is? I, 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 the arguments have yet to take place. Okay. There are briefs, briefs that have been filed, and every single dark money group you have ever heard of, including every group in, connected to the Kochs and every other group, is involved in filing amicus briefs in this thing. Clearly, the groups see it as something very important. Well, thank you to everyone for bringing such great insight and analysis and reporting. We'll leave it there for tonight. Many thanks to Aaron, Eamon, and Jane, and thank you for joining us. Make sure to sign up for our Washington Week newsletter on our website, where you'll get an early preview of each edition of Washington Week. I'm Amy Walter. Good night.